I think, and this is a this is an ancient view, that your number one artistic act, your most important one, the one that once you come of age, never stops, is that you are creating your life. You're really creating your character. Now, you started out getting molded by somebody else, but at the age of where you become liable for your choices, that's when you can start recreating, right? Then you're responsible. From then on, you're creating your life. And I think the good artists are the ones that are trying to help people create their lives or recreate, reform, and expand their imaginations and educate their emotions so that they think better, they act better, and they take pleasure in living within the universe, living the truth. The truth is we didn't create this universe. We can't manipulate it forever. We should live within it and we should understand it and appreciate it for its own sake, not in order to manipulate it. But anyway, so I think art is important. In all the ancient cultures, art is very important because it people weren't literate. And so the non verbal arts, the non-written arts were how people got educated. So this is a picture. If I'm not sure if it was in the Houston Smith book, I think so. He was so compassionate that a legend developed that in one of his previous lives, he was a goat and he protected these sheep and they were stuck on a hillside and he helped them down the hillside or he helped them, protected them from these um, guys who were gonna kill them. So, so every Buddhist would know, they would look at this, <coughs> it would remind them of a story. Just like if you go into a Catholic church and it has, this, that it has Jesus getting baptized by John, right? Every Christian sort of knows that story. And so there's all these, the storytelling about the icon of that particular tradition. Um, Here's the story of his birth. If you remember, she sat under the tree and she dreamed of an elephant that had a lotus flower and then uh, that came out of her navel. <laughs> and then she gave birth to Buddha. So that's her dream. And then here she is delivering the baby under, and, um, under the bow tree there on her way to sign up just uh, for, her, she had to go back to her village for some government thing, I think, to sign the role, just like Joseph had to. Uh, very incredible. And she ends up having a baby on the way or, or Mary. They got there and they weren't allowed in the inn. Uh, too crowded. So they had these babies under this very, you know, the idea is we're all alike, right? We all started out as babies. Um, our mothers, you know, had us and we started out in the same kind of conditions anyone could. And so there she is again, lying down. Here's Buddha. So this one has three pictures of Buddha in various poses and then three pictures of sort of his life. And so, you know, it's kind of like a cartoon or something. Um, this is the one where you remember the four noble sites? He was protected from the sun and he went outside and then he saw sickness, aging and, uh, and death and then a monk. And he thought, that's what I want, his sense of calling. And then um, this one uh, is, I can't, I'm, I'm not quite sure if I remember all of them, but anyway, they're all clear stories from Buddha's life. And then this one is the earth touching pose. Do you remember when after he had enlightenment, Maya, the evil one said, well, why don't you just kill yourself? And he said, someone will understand. And he touched the earth and Maya, the temp tempter went away. Um, here she is again. Um, 
And here is Buddha under the bow tree. So this is just fun. Like if you look up Buddhist art, you'll see so many different variations of this. And so this is a lot like the crucifixion that's, you know, we're going to have Easter. This is Holy Week. So Jesus, you know, literally was killed and then he rose again. Well, in other religions, Buddha was, you know, a prisoner of Maya and he had enlightenment. It's a natural transformation, right? It's a mental transformation. It's not a physical death and a physical, um, you know, overcoming death. Again, that's very anti-nature, like nature is out to get us. Nature's evil because we have to die. It's totally ridiculous. Um, the real transformation occurs in your mind. And so there was Buddha going about his business in the world before he was enlightened and then going about different business in the world after he was enlightened. Um, for Socrates, after he was enlightened, he went out, out to the Agora. He just talked to people and tried to make them transparent and accountable. There isn't any of that anti-natural stuff. The idea is that this is natural, like this is the complete human life. It's the one that's liberated from desire. Um, so you can have a free mind. Um, okay, so here's another rendition. Do you remember he, all these pleasures, especially sexy women at first. And I was thinking probably psychologically, that's true. If you deny yourself sensual pleasures, I would imagine that your mind probably resists that because there's a survival thing at stake. Um, I know that um, I deny myself when I'm studying. I was in Greece and I stared at a wall, literally stared at a wall to try and figure out what I was thinking that made me think everything I read was wrong. <laughs> but when that happened, I, you know, I had no sensory stimulation for sight hearing, smell, and touch. And so I knew when I was hungry, right? <laughs> and food really tasted good because that was the last thing left on the list. But I, so I think there's a psychological uh, insight there. There he is. And so Buddhism has a lot of Buddhist shrines where he's in a meditation pose or like this because this is what you're supposed to imitate, right? You're supposed to learn how to be able to be in the world, but not of the world. How to be able to separate yourself, but still um, you're in the world and it's not unnatural, right? It's the way you're meant to be. Like Buddha lived a complete human life by detaching himself from physical pleasures. There we are again. Um, he's, this is the teaching pose, I think. So he's a teacher. It's a, another one of the six poses. There's the earth pose again. Um, I think the main, the ones are pleasure and then death, fear, fear of death. But I can't quite tell what that one is. This one, I actually was at this temple. It's in Indonesia. It's so incredible. <laughs> I wish you could go. Um, and I have my pictures of it, but I don't know if we're ever going to get time to see them. I can post them and you can look at them. Oh, this is, this is important. Um, this is a Buddhist statue in part of Afghanistan. Because Afghanistan had, especially in the north, near the Silk Road, of course there were people going back and forth and of all different types. And there were always battles going on because obviously if somebody got control of the Silk Road, <laughs> they could charge you or they could do a lot of things to you because um, you had to get through. It was the only road between China and the West. Um, so, 
this is the section of Afghanistan that starts with the B bombman, something like that. Anyway, the Taliban bombed these statues and destroyed them um, because they said, how come you care so much about statues and not about people? I have a student from Asia University who grew up in that area and her family is Muslim, but her father was an artist and he made this whole series of artworks of this statue and he put it in a cultural context. So a different point in history, he would have different things in the background. And when the Taliban got power again, she wrote me a letter because she's is they're all worried that her family is going to be a target for the Taliban and her dad might get put in prison or killed. She was trying to apply for asylum. Uh, I wished I could have done something for her, but it was partly because her dad painted these statues and he actually kept, kept them in his house hidden, you know, oh my God. Anyway, and she was such a smart young woman when I had her in class. She loved philosophy and she was very good at it. But now, of course, she's in the US and she's placed in a college. I'm not quite sure which one, but her family, a lot of the AUW students, you know, they're very lucky to get to the US and get a full ride scholarship, but they're just totally worried about their families. Um, this is the monastery, so that some Buddhists went to monasteries and, and then some went out into the world. Just like in Hinduism, you have the path of reflection, then you have the path of action, you have the path of the heart. And, um, but in, in these traditions, secular people, people who are on the uh, managers and workers and family members and all that, they come to the monasteries for retreats. And that's very natural. I mean, the Catholics do that. And I'm actually going on a retreat for the 10th time with the uh, Benedictine nuns up near where I grew up. <clears throat> I just got it accepted my proposal. So, but I do think that that's healthy. It's been proved proven over and over that the mind needs that time away. The white, we can even measure it with our machines, this white matter in the back, close to the brain stem, in the root of the brain. And then there's the, the sensory stimulation, which is the corpus um, colossum. But kids that are, are formed by uh, machines and phones, their brains are disintegrating, <laughs> okay? This part is falling apart because it's overstimulated. And the white part is not developing. It's like we have all the machinery to measure that our culture is suicidal and we're destroying ourselves. And we still do nothing <laughs> because so many, because wealthy people make so much money by us being constantly dis distracted and they can control the political campaigns. And people go to advertisements in order to decide how to vote, which is totally ridiculous. And they wait to decide until two months, three, I, there was a poll about this, two or three months before an election and they decide based on the economy which is just ridiculous because it's so short term and it's so impulsive and rich folk can control what the economy is like right before an election. So I, I just, it boggles my mind that people can't step back enough to know if, if you can't send your kid to a decent school, it's gonna cost you a lot of money. Either you have to move to get a better school or you have to pay for them to go to a better school or they get a crappy job the rest of their life. Like, oh, it's, it's unbelievable how short-sighted Americans are 
in their voting behavior. And, but it's all related to everything else, every behavior. And it has to do with money, I'm afraid. So here we go with the slides. Now, I'm going to read to you some of those excerpts from the wisdom of the Buddha. And you have them there, but I, I don't want to, I, I think I could show you the excerpt over here and the slide over here, but I just want to show you the slide bigger and then I can read. And so I really encourage you someday to go and find, go to a museum and stand in front of these um, Zen Buddhism black ink drawings because they're so amazing. They just suck up your energy. People who stand in front of them are just very quiet and very peaceful. Um, well, let me let me do this for a second. I know I this is where I left off last time. I said we had these similarities. There's uh, Buddhism here. So we're going to look at the Zen Buddhist art. And so what you should think about is, first of all, the subject of the art. It landscape painting. Why landscape painting, right? Why flower arrangements? Why a tea ceremony? Why? Because it's important that you ask that. Because in the mind of the creator, this person has lived a Buddhist life, a Zen Buddhist life. And their Zen Buddhism is the, the buzz, right? The point of view, the meditational state that they're in when they create the painting because they want the painting to lead you into that state. They're trying to teach you how to live. And also while they are teaching themselves how to live, or they are living the truth. So they're living the truth about life. Um, so you think about what about the color? What about the design? What about the way space works? Okay, Mia, hi. Um, we're just talking about these paintings. And I want you while you're looking at them, to think about all these aspects of the painting and how they're they're educating you in a, a view of reality that the Zen artist wants to pull you into. He or she wants you to see reality this way. So the subject matter, the relation between humans and nature, okay? Um, after showing the slides, I'll ask you to think about the following. Right? How does the art ref, uh, reflect these beliefs? The belief in no soul, right? There's no soul. It's just you, the inner Atman, the outer Atman. Like, there's no there, there, right? Um, the four noble truths life is suffering, the cause is selfish desire, the cure is release. Um, and then the release. And then the eightfold path being right mindfulness, right concentration. So the artwork tries to get you into the right mind, the right concentration. Um, let's see, uh, a different way of understanding what's in front of your eyeballs, okay? Nirvana, trying to um, uh, get get in touch with your infinite self. Um, the doctrine of Anika, that finite things are transitory and less real than the inner self and the infinite energy. It break the language barrier, stop talking to yourself, stop with these constant arguments, right? The West is obsessed with arguments. Um, with left brain thinking. And Zen Buddhism tries to literally blow your mind, <laughs> blow all that stuff away. So I have this art. And then again, in your posts, you can write about, um, should, we, should artists create images that connect them to their own race, class, gender, uh, and history? 
um, or should they create images uh, which um, are faithful to those? Or do you have to think of the religion in a historical context? Obviously, this art is trying to get as far away from that as possible because that's the philosophy is that there's no self and all that other stuff is related to your physical self. Um, all right, so let's look at these slides, right? And then I have the wisdom of the Buddha. And so I'll read some excerpts from that. Um, I guess I'll have, I'll just run through them once and you can think about the color, the perspective, all that sort of stuff. Um, where's the focal point? Um, all right, and here's another one. All right, so I'll, I guess I'll read, I'll start reading and you can see the connection. I'm not quite sure if I have these in exactly the same order as the slides, but all right, so the first thing, all that we are is the result of what we've thought. It's founded on what we've, we've thought. It's made up of our thoughts. If a person speaks with an evil thought, pain follows him like the wheel, as the wheel follows the foot of the ox that draws the carriage. All that we, all that we are is a result of what we thought. If a person speaks with a pure thought, happiness follows him. So literally, you create yourself. I think I said this before, being like almost 70 years old, I know that that's true. And I look back at my life and I know, I wish I had never made a mistake. <laughs> I wish I had never had an evil thought because they just, drag it down. Um, so they, you do have to live with it. That's the sad part. Um, hatred does not end by hatred. Hatred ends by love. This is an old rule. Um, he who lives looking for pleasure only uh, will certainly, the tempter Mara will certainly overthrow him as the wind throws down a weak tree. Um, all right, so here's another quote that's related to this picture and a number of pictures. As rain breaks through an ill-thatched house, passion will break through an unreflecting mind. As rain does not break through a well-thatched house, passion will not break through a well-reflecting mind. Um, so that when Buddhists look at a picture that has a thatched house in it, of course they know, ah yes, it's a symbol, right? A well-thatched house is a symbol of a, uh, a strong mind, a reflecting mind. Then, um, let's see, there's always a river here, there's water here, that's really important, I'll show you. There's the thatched house again. But here, down here, is a bridge with a river. Um, all right, and here's, the, here's a man on an island. So here's the quote. Um, by rousing himself, by earnestness, by restraint and control, the wise person makes for himself an island which no flood can overwhelm. And so when you see... Uh, a person over on having crossed a bridge over on an island. That's what you're thinking. Um, then there's, okay, I, there's a terrace. I'll read this and then we'll find one that has terraces on the mountainside. When the learned person drives away vanity, the wise person climbing the terraced heights of wisdom looks down upon the fools. Uh, free from sorrow, he looks upon the sorrowing crowd as one that stands on a mountain looks down upon them that stand on the plain. So we will have some pictures of that in a minute. Um, let's see. Um, 
Okay. All right, so let me just look, let me just go through these a little bit more and then I'll talk about a few more themes. But another thing is that he wanted, he, he talked about the, the Buddha nature of everything. The Buddha nature is the inner, right? It's all part of the Atman. So he has these pictures where he, they just give you just enough to know that you're looking at a mountain, but it doesn't, you know, it, it minimizes the amount of sensory stimulus you get. You just get enough to know that this is analogous to what I see with my eyeballs, but he's giving you the Buddha nature, right? The energy underneath it. Same with uh, trees. He's giving you the Buddha nature of a tree, not what a modern scientist would do is just examine, you know, more and more particulars and the nature of the bark and where it blah, 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 right? Just the opposite. Um, okay, so here again is the image of a man crossing a bridge. Now the image of Buddha, and it was in the chapter, the crossing is an image of going from a life that's dedicated to passion to enlightenment. It's the crossing over from one state of mind to a liberated state of mind. And so a lot of the pictures will have uh, a bridge and a, a person crossing over the bridge. And everybody knows what that means. Um, Buddha was also called the, the um, boat, the boatman who helped you across the bridge. If you needed to cross a river, um, there would be a boatman there and he would take you across. And so Buddha is that kind of boatman. He gives you these meditation techniques and helps you to cross the um, river. There's the river again. Um, and there's the man on the island, right? Or woman, I, you know, we're, we're gonna go gender free here. Um, the thing that I liked about this one is if you look close, a little more closely, and this is true of some of the other ones that I'm going to show you, is that they blend in a lot. Like the figures look like rocks, basically. They, they blend in with the background, and they are like an island, right? Um, this is another one that gives you the, um, I think that some of these, I, there's the Buddha nature. Oh yeah, this one is, you see this person meditating. Oh, here he is. If you can see him, he looks just like, um, he looks like the rock and the stick he's holding looks like the tree. And so he's like a microcosm of the macrocosm. <laughs> I love that. I, that's kind of my thing. Uh, wisdom is where you make your mind a microcosm of the macrocosm. Um, all right. And he's looking across the water, right, to the mountaintop. Um, all right. Here's another one where the, the person is following like the stick follows the same line as around him and his robe and all that really blends in to the natural background. Um, this is one that has these birds in it that show you the Buddha nature of a bird, although they got cut off, so those aren't the best pictures. Here they are. Here's the Buddha birds. And my favorite are the Buddha mice. I love these Buddha mice. Um, just think what a great artistic, I don't know, I, I can't draw at all. And it just seems so amazing. You can just put a few marks on a piece of paper and it completely communicates. Like, you know what he's actually, there's a mouse in my house and I got to report it to my, but you know what he's referring to, but it's still, it's absolute minimum. I mean, if he put any less on the paper, you might not even know. But that was his goal as an artist, was just to trigger the mind 
to recognize it in the material world, but to see it as just part of the spiritual world. So here's the lotus, and the lotus is a big deal in Buddhism. Uh, Buddha is always sitting on a lotus flower, and his first sermon was the lotus sermon, if you remember. And there was a, a man who was extremely poor. His job was to sort of collect flowers um, that had been thrown out or something, the ones with a little bit of life left and try to sell them so he didn't starve. But Buddha pulled, held out a lotus flower and that, that guy understood it. He understood the sermon. Um, and it was just, aha, uh -huh, you know, it's about the Buddha nature. And he became a, a disciple of Buddha. Um, so the lotus, actually in China, they eat the lotus flower. They eat this section of it. Uh, I tried it. <laughs> And, you know, they usually put it in some kind of, it tastes kind of like jelly, you know, they put it in some sweet sauce or something. And that's fine. I mean, we eat plants, no problem. Um, this is a Zen garden. And so now you know that Zen paintings and Zen gardens look a lot alike. And Melanie, I assume you know, you know, that the Botanical Gardens in St. Louis has this gorgeous Zen garden way in the back you have to walk but it's so amazing um, yeah, it is really pretty yeah and you've been there yes i have oh it's so great and it does try to put you in that meditative state right it works <laughs> yeah it works uh then the tea ceremony is very formal and very calm right and and tea all over the world tea and tea ceremonies are a big deal and I think they are, they're all related to that, developing that reflective capacity of your mind and tying it to eating, which again is important. Uh, I think, you know, we don't ritualize eating at all. And of course we're obese, right? And a lot of people make a lot of money on our failure to sort of stop and reflect on, right, where the food comes from and having respect for, to me, mother nature that gives it to us. And I, I don't throw food, food away very much because I just feel like, who told you that you have a right to exploit mother nature and then just throw it away? I mean, it's okay to eat what you need and eat healthy foods, but she doesn't exist just for your pleasure or, you know, impulsiveness or whatever. And, but that would be the same with the Buddha, right? When you, when you do that, when you take more than you need and things like that, you're creating bad karma. And so the tea ceremony, I think, is just the first step in ritualizing your eating and your drinking. So you tie mind and body together. Um, Okay, I think that's, you know, we do our little woman thing. But, so, now I'll take reactions. Um, comments. Let's start with Mia, because you had comments maybe before you got to class also. Did you have comments before class and then comments on this? Uh, yes, ma'am, actually. Um, I'll start with, well, yeah, I'll start with my comments, I guess, before class. Um, for the, we were supposed to read the Buddha in the environment, or I can't remember exactly what it's called, but I really liked the part where it focused on, like, plants and animals, um, just talking about how, basically, it's just, like, the preservation of those things. Like, we don't have to destroy everything. And, like, the way, it, I mean, the way it worded it was so nice, because it's not saying that, like, oh, my gosh, you can't, like, again you can't not use the resources that are given to you it's just that you can't walk around just like a, 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 like killing things just because or you know it's like you take what you need not what not necessarily yeah you don't need to over over splurge on that that was something that I really liked and it, I, I felt like it was worded very well in that um and then on the paintings I really liked the 
I might say it wrong. The house, it was the thatched that thatched house. Is that thatched right? roof? Thatched roof. Yep. That's true. Okay, okay. I liked that. I liked um the coloring of it specifically because it was like, you know, like to tie into like the there is no or the no soul thing. It's like I feel like the lack of color, it was very blue, like blue and kind of maybe like beige. Like that was kind of the color theory that they were going with. And I liked that you know like I feel like the lack of color was kind of symbolism for that but the fact that it's not completely like black and white it's not like oh well you're just the shell like you get to make your own decisions and uh whatever like choices you make like what like bad choices bad person good choices good person essentially and so I kind of feel like that like the hint of like blue and just like like a little bit of color is like you get to make your own choices but I don't know. That was kind of what I interpreted. Well, the other thing was it's the infinite within. And if you look at the um, perspective, it has layers and layers and layers and layers and layers, right? And right. so that is that you're making yourself by your choices, right? And so you have layers and layers and layers. So it's a visual image of what's inside of you, right? Does that make sense? Well, so would the like would you say that like the foundation because the focal point of that I think is the actual house okay or, and so would you say that that is like the foundation and then you with each choice you make with each layer is like each layer so you kind of get to see more of the outer view or like the a different point of view I guess which is a zoomed out view that is what I'm saying if you if you're in that thatched house right? You don't let passions in, right? Mm -hmm. And so you're just within this context of the natural world, right? But then in the other ones, there isn't a focal point in a number of them. Mm -hmm. because It's just layer and layer and layer and layer. And there's no, right, no soul. So there's kind of this infinite within. And then other ones, their focal point was the mountain, right? but there's a mountain to climb in terms of getting in touch with the Atman. It's another symbol, or there's a river and a bridge. All of these are different sorts of symbols to get to the same, right? The same conclusion. Does that make sense? Yeah. So like you could have a bridge and then an island and then a thatched house over there, right? Because <laughs> he made that transition to the thatched house and yeah all of those every religion every ancient religion has a lot of symbols like we have the cross right but i just again think of that you have to kill the flesh <laughs> you know i just can't stand it i can't and then you have to be reborn which is completely without any flesh i don't like it you know and i think it's hard on women because women always get attached. Obviously, we deliver babies, hello. And that's supposed to be, you know, if if this world is evil and we deliver children into it, boy, that makes us a temptress. <laughs> eh, I don't like it. Um, what about you? Let's see, Jack, what do you think of the pictures? Um, I like the idea of um buddha being depicted as meditating a lot okay kind of like a lead by example um i also like the i don't know what what picture it went with but the quote um all we are is the sum of our thoughts yeah. and pure thoughts bring happiness i think that's true yeah and that you have that reading and it's right on page one mm. um the other thing you all can do is go online and get a picture of Buddha meditating or get one of the Zen and print them out and go to some print shop and get them blown up, you know, and you can have them on your wall for meditation. Um, so you can think about that. Um, okay, Melanie. Um, so I thought it was interesting how so on one side of the picture or one side of the bridge there was a lot of like mountains and trees and just huge things it kind of looked like chaos a little bit <clears throat> and then on the other side of the bridge usually where 
the people in the house was um it was it just looked simple like okay. there wasn't there wasn't much around it just looked simple and pure and not chaotic so I thought that was interesting and it fits in right yeah it's not intrusive right so it's very much like sustainability right mm -hmm. it's an image of sustainability yeah um which we're gonna need and you know to just look around and say well well that's utopia to think we've achieved we're never going to achieve it it's just that you have to train yourself not to want all those excesses and to do that you have to keep something in mind right some image in mind of what you want your soul to be like right this isn't literally about what you want constructed or not constructed next door it's about what kind of soul you want mm -hmm. and you can have a peaceful soul with a thatched roof within the context of living in new york city or something um does that make sense guys yes okay anyway so art is on ancient cultures it's the tool to go from the sensuous from the sensual to the spiritual. So you use visual, you use music, but you're always trying to get to the other side, right? You, you stimulate the pleasure side just enough to get into that deeper side. Um, okay, so let's go to the next thing, which is the Buddha and the brain, the monk in the lab. And this is just saying, and there's a lot of research about this, that Buddhist meditation has been shown to work. Oh my God, you're kidding. <laughs> and he's done all these studies on Buddha and the brain, and they put all the electrodes on your head. Um, it's worth noting that these methods are not just useful, they're inexpensive. You don't need a drug. Uh oh. Uh oh, <laughs> somebody's gonna go. No, 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 no. It's not Christian. We gotta no, no. <laughs> uh -oh. uh, all right. It's again the profit motive is going to keep you from knowing about this stuff, or it's you know you're gonna say you're not patriotic. You're not buying stuff or something. Um. All right. So let's see, what's the other one? Oh, and then there was an article about art. Um, and you don't have to be a, a doctrine, like you don't have to be a self-described Buddhist or this or that, right? That's just an ideology, that's a brand. You don't have to brand yourself anything. You just have to understand things. And then artists are the ones, they don't care about it ideology or doctrine or orthodoxy they just create something um that's trying to educate themselves and trying to educate other people about how we should live okay so um i'll if you want to comment on that um later on that's great i'm going to go back to the environment at the moment um, I did want to, there's one quote from the Hindu in the environment one that I think is good. Um, it's that we can't really throw away religion until recently. Okay, so what's happening as a matter of fact is religions are getting used as weapons to pit people against each other. They're getting used in an anti-science way right people won't take a vaccine because they've gotten frightened by their political whatever opponents to um in the name of religion so now all we got again you've got this split but there's nothing in the religions that would advocate for not taking a vaccine <laughs> um because the illness is not 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 i mean to use your mind to bring the body back to positive karma 
is not anti-religious. Um, it's just when we substitute drugs for meditation or when, right, that there's abuses of drugs, definitely. But when you use a vaccine, that's going to help everybody. So it's about everybody taking it so everybody stays healthy. It's about developing karma. So sometimes, you know, just because companies make money off of it doesn't mean it's bad, but it doesn't mean it's good. And so you really have to figure out which cases is it where greed goes off the rails and which cases is it where it doesn't. And why, what motive do politicians have for setting this up? Um, so politicians definitely have a power motive when they start corrupting people's judgments uh, based on pitting science against religion. So until recently, um, the, the role of the spiritual heritage and culture was ignored. And still, you have so many people writing articles about the facts, about climate change or whatever. You're never going to get through to people. And there's nothing wrong with bringing religion in, real religion, right? Um, from the perspective of many world religions, the abuse and exploitation of nature for greed is, is unethical. Like There's no reason not to bring religion in. So here we have Buddhism in the environment. Um, and again, I'll stop after this. Well, maybe I'll go to the woman one too before I really stop and let you talk. So keep in mind, right? There's the Buddha and the brain. There's the Buddha um, religion and science. There's Buddha and the environment and Buddha and women. And so uh, then I'll stop and you'll have to talk. <laughs> um, nature is dynamic. Um, <clears throat> so there's this natural process from physical, biological, psychological, moral, causal. Um, man and nature are bound together, mutual interaction. And all the art is like this, right? Um, the moral force at work, the human use of natural resources, greed is bad. Only in America can politicians get away with saying greed is good or um, climate change is a hoax. So we have the most scientists, we have the most climate scientists, and we have the most deniers. <laughs> and we're leading the way in, in destroying the environment. Um, China is catching up, but still per capita, no. Okay, so the attitude toward plant life, um, okay, good. Um, and uh, lots of times, or one thing in these countries is that within the monasteries, there's a reverence towards certain trees, of course, the bow tree. Um, and there's attitudes toward pollution. There's nature is beautiful. A lot of these cultures, of course, developed when they absolutely had to pay attention um, in order to survive. So they have a lot of old traditions that are very much focused on sustainability just because they had to. But then as soon as we had a choice, we have started to, to exploit and we can't stop. Like we're addicted to exploiting nature. Um, and then let me do um, the women, because once again, like always, um, there's nothing in Buddhism that would make it sexist, right? I have an Atman nature. I can meditate. I can do this. All the things the Brahmins said and the Hindus said. If you're a woman, it means that you haven't had enough incarnations or you did something bad and you got demoted. Okay, well, Buddha says that's nothing. That's just a false story. So, and he said, you don't have to know all the orthodoxies. You don't have to have all the rituals. You don't have to, you know, 
forget all that stuff. All you have is relieving pleasure, right? Liberating yourself. Well, why wouldn't that be true for women? Why aren't women, you know, equally capable? So it just doesn't make any sense at all that Buddhism would be sexist. Now, what happens? Well, in, in this case, the problem is too much focus on meditation and not enough on action. So all the suffering that goes on and the monks are just meditating, right? And there, you know, people will come there for their spiritual retreat, but they don't go back out in the world and try to fix the injustices. So, um, so that would be the downside of Buddhism if people get too preoccupied with not being angry or not being right. Whereas the Greek model is go out there and live a full life. It means you'll have an entire range of emotions. It means you will have to avoid getting angry a lot of times, but you can ask yourself, would I rather have volunteered for this project than not have volunteered? Even if this and that is annoying. If you're, if you're a Greek type, you'll say, no, I'd rather be involved. I'd rather have a complete life and a complex life, even if it's complex and difficult. So that when you focus too much on meditation, you can just get too willing to allow suffering to go on around you and just say, well, those prostitutes, if they just you know, learned how to not have desires, they'd be okay. <laughs> right? And the passing on of AIDS and stuff. These are real problems. Um, so Buddha raised him, right? Buddha had an aunt. Um, now, the thing about it is there's what was said about Buddha years after he died and what Buddha actually thought. And so at least the legend is that he changed his mind. Um, you know, it's possible that he never did resist, and that's just the story being told. But the main thing is he changed. Um, and then for the, the, the sisters, the Benedictine sisters that I live with, they're the most independent minded women, and they have been for centuries. You want to find a powerful, independent-minded, professional woman? It was nuns. And so it was Buddhist nuns. Um, and there are the women at the monastery where I go, no Buddhist nuns in Indonesia and around the world. Like the nuns are in contact with each other. They know each other's monasteries. And they... Often they'll get sent abroad to connect with those monasteries to create a whole network of nuns. So it's amazing when you meet them. I have meals with them and things. And it's just, it's a great world. Uh, they all had professional jobs. That's what they talk about, right? They don't talk about money. And they don't talk about men. And they don't talk about power. And they don't talk about any of that standard stuff. Um, they talk about doing their jobs well and their sisters, their sisterhood, their history with the other sisters and also running institutions and um, maintaining, they pray four times a day, but it's not at all self-abnegating. It's very self-affirming. Um, and that's true in a lot of, it's amazing. It's not just Catholicism. Um, and for Buddhism, it's a much longer tradition also. Um, I think, I mean, Catholicism, the tradition, I don't know if there were women very early on. It just got later, the church got bigger. Oh, probably though, actually. Okay, eight rules. Okay, so here's something just like Hinduism. These rules were attributed to Buddha, but there's no reason to think. It's just like the code of Manu. And they're just awful, right? You have to be totally subservient 
to the monks. What? <laughs> right? And that's 400 years after he died. There's no way, right? It's a misrecord of Buddha's attitude. The historical developments. Okay, Thailand has this huge problem with prostitution. Um, and then there's these general trends about class and how so many theologies are um, based on class. So the lower classes are told that if you just suck up now, you'll be released. And Buddhism can go that way, you know, just meditate and you'll get liberation. Um, and the privileged class explains why, because they, you know, God preferred them. That's what the Hindus did. And that's what Buddha was against. Um, so the, the criticism, it's too centered on personal and ignores social injustices. Okay, uh, religion and globalization. This is a big problem. And this is what I see when I teach over there in Asia. Um, oh my gosh. You go to these countries, Indonesia, they have these shopping malls that are just disgusting, you know? This is not a wealthy country. And it's all this stuff and it's very expensive. It's completely unnecessary. And they're really crowded because a lot of people come who can't afford this stuff, but they love to window shop. It's just a complete fantasy world, right? And just like it is in the US, it's just so oh, agonizing. Um, so when I was living in one of the cities, Jogjakarta, I was in a hotel not far from one of these shopping malls. So we used to go and read the New York Times, or I actually read the Jakarta Post, which is the best paper in English. And it really told me a lot of important stuff. And I still have scans of a lot of those articles, but oh my gosh, the food was crappy. You know, in Indonesia, the cheap food is fruits and vegetables because it grows all over the place. And, and fish, they'd all have their own fish pond, but they're just getting corrupted. Like they want to eat junk food. They want to eat McDonald's. It's like, oh, please. And they're getting fat because they don't exercise as much. And oh, geez, it's really sad. And then there's all this technical stuff going on, agribusiness, and seeds, you know, farmers can't keep their seeds. They're in, they're in debt to multinational companies. Um, so there's all that, all that way that the rich are getting religion, richer. And then the religion of the market, people are buying into it. Um, girls are sold in exchange for a motorbike. And again, we can be self-righteous about that, but, but colonialization has exploited people and they're responding. <laughs> um, it's, we're all in this together. There's no use. I, I always think that the powerful are the ones that should take the most responsibility. They started it. <laughs> um, so I don't, I'm not critical of the people who get sucked in as much as um, the people who suck them in and do it in the name of religion, which really annoys me the most. Um, Buddhism as a way to address the problem of prostitution. Um, all right, education. I mean, the main, one of the main points that keeps coming out over and over is the importance of education for liberating people, really liberate their minds. Um, so everybody's got a clock in with hopefully more than one reaction, like one reaction to the environment, one reaction to the Buddha and the brain, and one reaction to the Buddha and women, um, maybe in addition to what you said before. So I'll start with Melanie. Do you have some reactions? Um, so I guess I just thought uh, it was interesting, like, Okay, well, first of all, I don't really understand like the eight, I guess the eight rules, like were those made up 
or did that come from Buddha? Okay, so he's just giving you a technique, right, for how okay. to achieve liberation. Mm -hmm. And so it's not like an absolute rule. It's just that you have to have right mindfulness, right? Yeah. And you have to have um, good friends because otherwise you're going to get out of touch. Yeah. And so it's just sort of, it's a way of life more than it's a rule. The trouble about rules is don't tell a lie. I mean, it has, you're, if you're doing it out of fear or force or obedience to somebody else, forget it. So it's not really a rule. Right? Okay. If you want to, if you want to be liberated, you have to have right concentration, right? You have to learn. Mm -hmm. how to concentrate. <clears throat> Does that help? Yeah, that helps. Thank you. Okay. Um, and my other comment, um, I thought it was interesting how, you know, um, Buddha and Buddhism is focused on um, like not like staying away from your desires, like blocking those things out. And now like, this area is being corrupted with all of the things that we're supposed to be ignoring money, prostitution, sex, things like that. And I just, where did it go wrong? It was so good. Yeah. And that's where he's, you know, globalization has affected it, right? Yeah. Colonialization. And we're brainwashing people into mm -hmm. making them want this stuff because we make money off of that. Yeah. Um, we're exploiting their natural resources. We're exploiting their human resources. But I mean, we do it to our own people, right? Yeah. We exploit our own bodies to make money, selling rotten food and selling unhappiness and selling depression drugs. And right, we've colonized our bodies, we've colonized our minds. And so we go do it abroad. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> It's sad. Yeah. Um, anything else? Do you have? So obviously, women aren't going to get the kind of treatment that's appropriate if you if all the other values are wrong. Right. This isn't bode, going to bode well for women, especially when they tend to get associated with pleasures. Yeah, with desires. <laughs> guys project their crap onto them. Okay. Yes. Um, okay, Mia. Okay, um, my comment, I guess I'll start about my environmental comment. It's kind of the same comment that I had. It's like, I, um, you know, I, I like the idea that it's just preser the preservation of life in general, as opposed to like, like, it doesn't necessarily put humans on a higher, like people on a higher scale. It's just like, well, I mean, yeah, it's just like you, t like, like take care of mother nature um that was kind of my environmental one and then I had another comment that was kind of relating to the other two which was just that um uh what was it I think it's talking kind of about how we have taken it and corrupted it which I feel like the U.S. in general has just capitalized on well on religion in general but especially on religions or practices that we aren't that aren't necessarily that don't uh like are originated in the U.S. like Buddhism you know some things like that like uh so in Texas we have to take this thing called the star test this is where I'm getting this from um and so every star test has like you have like a math portion a reading portion whatever and every reading portion usually there's something about culture or religion or something like that and my sophomore year, the one that I was reading about was a uh, reli uh, religion portion. It was specific. I think it was, I don't remember. If, I think it was about Hinduism, but I feel like it probably cross applies, which it was about this girl and she was moving to America and just like coming from where she was coming from. And then to America, it was like, oh, here are these people selling my religion and then selling it wrong. And it's just like, I think that's something that's so wild, how you can just take things, it, you can take like how we just take things and we manipulate them and to make it like fit under the laws of capitalism so that it can better our country so that people understand that like 
Christianity is what rules the entire thing. Because also one other section in there was that like selling it wrong was like, oh, these people are harmful and they're dirty. And obviously it's not working for them because they come from these like very underdeveloped countries. And yeah, that was kind of my comment on that. I just think that's kind of crazy how we take things and we just capitalize them and we capitalize them incorrectly. So, yeah. And then what you have to do is see the analogy with politics. You know, we completely corrupt what it means to be a good citizen and what the goal of a politician is. The goal is to create a middle class and that's never discussed. It's just all, anything but that because then you'd see that, ah, uh, we're not doing that. You know, all this other stuff that we argue about is only shrinking the middle class. And that's all a politician has the power to do. And they do have the power to do that, right? Tax the wealthy, uh, put regulations on things so that we don't destroy the environment. It's just amazing how the political conversation avoids that, right? And it's just to exploit people. So it's just like if you had someone talking about healthy eating. <laughs> oh boy, you know, nobody would make any money, right? So you never talk about whether the food is healthy or not. You just talk about how good it is or whatever, right? Oh my gosh, yeah. The other thing was the way that consciousness just emerges, right? It's just an, a product of evolution, right? So that's why plants, animals, you know, first non-living, living, less developed, more developed. So consciousness is just on a continuum. I think that's kind of what you meant, right? It doesn't separate you. It's just that it's another manifestation of the Atman. That's it, you know? Um, it's just that people have to choose to turn toward it because they do have to eat and things. But clearly they don't eat or do that stuff very well they become totally miserable unless they turn toward the Atman and govern those things by being in touch with their consciousness, right? Their inner Atman. Okay. What about you, Jack? Um, I definitely think globalism is allowing capitalism to influence more countries, like the idolization of fashion. I think that's spreading. Um, I think that's because of the influence that America has in capitalism. I think that that's going to lead to a lot more environmental destruction. Um, I also liked the when they were talking about in the environmental article about Buddha telling his followers not to walk during the rainy season to not kill the worms. <laughs> that was, I think it's kind of a little bit extreme to do that yes i know that's where it gets too self-absorbed that's what he's pointing out right mm -hmm. when buddhism gets too self-absorbed mm -hmm. too concerned with not experiencing any pleasure too removed from social injustices so i i, I agree with you there but mm -hmm. um but also, that's, go also, ahead also on um I do, when you're talking about nuns, um, I also think they deal with desire also. Like, I don't think it's that you can just become this completely enlightened person that's just perfect. So I don't know. The, the, for better or worse, they have a long formation process. So when you first take your vows, it's like five years of spiritual formation and you have to keep deciding if you want. Um, and then um, the other thing though, is that they sit in tables that are in a circle. So you talk while you're eating, right? I mean, there's a lot of ways that the system is designed to try and get people to eat healthy, not to eat too fast, not to eat too much or too little. And of course they serve healthy foods. They don't, they serve desserts, but I mean, you don't, and you get some choices, you get maybe three entrees, but 
they don't throw unhealthy food at you and you pick your portions and stuff like that. So there's a lot of ways that the environment recognizes that we need some kind of way to ritualize, to tie it to conversation, to tie it to fellowship, right? That used to be the big thing in the Methodist church. You know, you'd sing, you'd have a prayer, and then you'd have fellowship around the table. But it's mostly about the fellowship, not about chowing down, right? Does that make sense? And hospitality is a big value in ancient traditions. Um, all right, so we're out of time. We started next time with Islam. So let me give you just one last reminder. I think I showed this to you before, but it is pretty amazing where he says, don't believe anything just because you've heard it. Don't believe in traditions because it's always been that way. Don't believe because a lot of people say so. Don't believe because it's written in the books. Don't believe on the authority of teachers. Uh, after observation and analysis, if it's conducive, it agrees with reason and it liberates you, then go ahead. So that's that should, I hope, blow your mind a lot and get you into just a much wider view of what these traditions are about. So, bye-bye. See you on Tuesday.